thanks so much for coming. Um, before Chris reads, um, I just wanted to tell a little story um, about the book to kind of frame one of the things that I think is so special um, about why we came to the city. Um, on a trip to California a couple of years ago, um, Chris and I visited a little vineyard in Sonoma County with some friends for a wine tasting. Um, we were brought out among the vines where the owner had set up this little picnic table with glasses for us to try everything. And of course, everything was so good that we could not bear to spit any of it out. Um, so about halfway through um, a, couple, a couple of the glasses in, the founder of the vineyard came out to talk with us. Um, he was a 90-year-old man named George McLeod um, who drove up, on a, drove up to our group on a John Deere tractor um, and started talking to us about what making wine make, means to him. Um, he liked the work, he told us. Um, he liked the community, and he certainly liked the wine. What he liked best was what he called his new appreciation for terroir, um, the character that the wine takes on from year to year. Every season, his wine tastes different based on what's happened throughout the year, how much rain there was, how much sun there was, um, how frequently the land was tilled, and even according to George, how much music the vines were played. Um, there's a story about mariachi that I won't go into, but as you can imagine, um, it, was a, it was a pretty colorful place. Um, the vines changed based on the care that George gave them, and George and his staff had to change with what they did year to year to keep up with the shifting conditions. And what's more, George told us, he'd learned that the grapes taste better when he really had to work for them. When the weather was cold or the rain was sparse and he and his team really had to get creative about how they cared for the vines, that's when the wine always came out the most interesting and, in his opinion, the best. So why we came to the city, I think, is a book about terroir, about how the world around us impacts our character and what we do and who we become. It's a book that celebrates the moments that shape us, the victories we savor, the surprises that change our course, the people who we allow to get close enough to celebrate along with us. And maybe George was just trying to sell us, you know, sell us his, his young wine or put a good spin on a difficult situation. But I like to think that what he said was true. The struggle is what makes the wine so sweet. This book is a beautiful tribute to that struggle, about the weather conditions that shape our own personal terroir, whether we want them to or not, and the people who we turn into as we till the land and reap our rewards. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Ransom. Hi, everyone. Uh, it is beyond exciting to see so many people here tonight, so many wonderful friends and great uh, familiar faces. And, and new friends uh, to people I, I hope to meet soon. Um, I just wanted to start off uh, really quickly tonight by uh, thanking uh, Noreen and everybody here at the Center for Fiction. Um, I, a uh, long time back, uh, had a little writer's space uh, upstairs on the sixth floor. Uh, I think it was uh, a little desk and a, and a little locker to put my stuff in, which uh, they told me uh, had just been used by Nicole Krauss before me, so I was really, I felt like I had some <laughs> magical uh, influence. Um, but this is a wonderful place that supports writers like me uh, and, uh, and, and makes all sorts of things possible uh, for us, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be back here again. Uh, I read here um, uh, three years ago uh, uh, for, with my first novel, um, uh, The Unchangeable Spots of Leopards, uh, and it's just uh, so wonderful uh, to be able to come back here. This is sort of uh, uh, the end of my uh, tour. I've been sort of all over the country in the last two weeks, so I apologize if I'm still a little sleep deprived. Um, I wanted to uh, just talk uh, a little bit before the reading uh, tonight, um, just to kind of talk a little bit about uh, why I came to the city, uh, which is something that uh, I've, uh, I've, I'm eager to sort of share. Um, this book, of course, is called Why We Came to the City. Um, and uh, I just uh, the, wanted to talk about, yeah, why I came to the city and what I've done here. Um, 13 years ago, uh, after being put, uh, reje uh, rejected uh, from every other MFA program that I applied to, um, I got a call from somebody at Columbia University asking, offering me a spot in their MFA program. Is that working? Just gonna bring it up. All right. Um, as I nearly passed out, uh, this person added, not everybody was sure that you would be ready, uh, but anyway, welcome to the program. <laughs> uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be ready either, um, but I was determined to figure it out. Uh, I went uh, to try to find some, uh, some assistance, financial assistance for coming. Uh, I went to speak to a dean at, uh, at the college uh, where I was studying as an undergrad, studying writing, uh, and he sort of very dreamily told me that uh, he thought that I shouldn't get my MFA, I shouldn't move to New York, I should, uh, rather than uh, go and, and, and study writing that I needed to, uh, and this is an exact quote, uh, he told me that I should wander the desert for several years, uh, that I needed to get grist for the mill, 
Uh, and I thought to myself, you know, you don't get grist in the desert for one thing, but um, <laughs> anyway. Um, and so I, uh, so I ignored his advice uh, and I came. Uh, and, and he introduced, I think, something really uh, important that it took me a long time to really fully understand, which is that it's not only important to learn how to write, but also to have something to say. Um, and uh, when I got here to New York, I started to figure out, I think, what that thing was that I wanted to say. Uh, I never lived here before. I never spent a whole lot of time here, even though I grew up in New Jersey, not that far away. Uh, most of my visits had been as a tourist to Broadway shows and museums and uh, on field trips, uh, things like that. Um, for two years, that when I was first living here, I rarely left the narrow corridor between my classrooms uh, and my apartment. Uh, I had two friends, uh, both of whom were here tonight, thankfully, uh, both from college, uh, friends who I met with once a week. Uh, we ate a cheap dinner every Wednesday night uh, together and then came back to one of our apartments to watch television because that was the only thing we could afford to do um, during a time. Uh, and, of, and, and every week we would get together and we'd all sort of brag to each other about how wonderfully everything was going, which now looking back on it I think was probably mostly BS, but uh, <laughs> we made ourselves feel a lot better. Uh, and we, even though we were scared out of our minds uh, most of the time. Uh, and then slowly, uh, something strange sort of happened. Uh, as the longer I stayed here, uh, the more new friends came, uh, the more I, uh, I made better friends with people that were here. Uh, my then girlfriend, now lovely wife and formal introducer, uh, moved here, uh, and she's a much better mixer and braver soul than I am, uh, helped us find all sorts of new friends. Uh, suddenly the whole thing just didn't seem so bad anymore. Um, I fell in love with this place. Um, it, was, it wasn't uh, a place that I had been ready for, as it turned out, um, but I learned how to write, and I found something to write about. Um, this is the city where I first made my family, uh, where I wrote my first book. Uh, actually, I wrote uh, three before that, uh, before that one got published. Um, this is the city where I got married, uh, where I found work, got lost, and learned how to be an adult. Uh, this is the city where I faced death for the first time and created life. Uh, here, I helped create life, I should say. Uh, <laughs> um, I did the easy part. Um, uh, here, uh, this is the city where uh, I got to f experience living in the middle of everything at once. Uh, as I write this, and this is, this is no joke, uh, a famous author uh, walked by the window of the cafe uh, where I was sitting writing this this afternoon. Uh, ben Lerner was buying toilet paper. Um, <laughs> Um, and that's a rare thing. That's an exciting thing that, uh, that I get to be so close to that and, and to, to be a part of it. Uh, I love the city dearly, and I love the city, the people that it has introduced me to dearly. Um, and this is a book that I wrote to try to somehow um, say that to the city, uh, and most importantly, to all of you. Um, thank you so much for letting me share uh, this book with you guys tonight. Uh, I wanted to share one more quick thing before I get into the prologue of the book, uh, and then I'm going to read a little from the prologue uh, and chapter one of the book to give you a taste of it. Um, hanging above my writing desk at home uh, is uh, a gift I got from my sister uh, a long time ago for Christmas. Uh, it's an Oscar Wilde quote that I have framed uh, with a photograph of some uh, college friends uh, in the middle of it. Uh, and the words in the quote uh, make up a philosophy uh, that I live, I, I try anyway, to live by and write by every day. Um, I thought that would be the best introduction for this book. Uh, the quote is, keep love in your heart. A life without it is like a sunless garden where the flowers are dead. The consciousness of loving and being loved brings a warmth and richness to life that nothing else can bring. Who being loved is poor. So anyway, thank you. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to read a little bit from the prologue of this novel, uh, which is called Why We Came to the City. Uh, I wrote this piece of the book uh, first. I didn't necessarily know at the time sort of what I was writing or that it was going to be part of a book. Um, but uh, it came out sort of all in a rush as I was trying to uh, figure out how to, again, kind of say something to um, this wonderful city and the people in it. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from this, and then I'll read from chapter one in the novel, where you'll get a chance to meet some of the characters and uh, find out sort of what the, what the plot of the story will be about. We came to the city because we wished to live haphazardly, to reach for only the least realistic of our desires, and to see if we could not learn what our failures had to teach, and not when we came to live discover that we had never died. We wanted to dig deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to be overworked and reduced to our last wit. And if our bosses proved mean, why then we'd evoke their whole and genuine meanness afterward over vodka cranberries and small batch bourbons. And if our drinking companions proved to be sublime, then we would stagger home at dawn over the old city cobblestones into hot showers and clean shirts 
and press onward until dusk fell again. For the rest of the world, it seemed to us, had somewhat hastily concluded that it was the chief end of man to thank God it was Friday and pray that Netflix would never forsake them. <laughs> Still we lived frantically, like hummingbirds, though our HR departments told us that our commitments were valuable and our feedback was appreciated, our raises would be held back another year. Like gnats, we pestered management, who didn't know how to use the internet, whose only use for us was to set up Facebook accounts so they could spy on their children, or to sync their iPhones to their outlooks, or to explain what tweets were, and more importantly, why, which even we did not know. <laughs> Retire, we wanted to shout. Get out of the way with your big thumbs and your senior moments and your nostalgia for 1976. We hated them. We wanted them to love us. We wanted to be them. We wanted to never, ever become them. Complexity, complexity, complexity. We said, let our affairs be endless and convoluted. Let our bank accounts be overdrawn and our benefits be reduced. Take our social security contributions and let it go bankrupt. We'd been bankrupt since we left home. We'd secure our own society. Retirement was an afterlife we didn't believe in and that we expected yesterday. Instead of three meals a day, we'd drink coffee for breakfast and scavenge from empty co conference rooms for lunch. We had plans for dinner. We'd go out and buy gummy pad thai and throat scorching chicken vindaloo and bento boxes in chintzy dark restaurants that were always about to go out of business. And those who were a little flush would cover those who were a little short and we would promise them coffees in repayment. We still owed someone for a movie ticket last summer and they hadn't forgotten. Complexity, complexity. In holiday seasons, we gave each other spider plants and badly decoupage pots and scarves we'd just learned how to knit and cufflinks purchased with employee discounts. We followed the instructions on food and wine websites, but our souffles sank and our baked brie's burned and our basil ice creams froze solid. We called our mothers to get recipes for old favorites, but they never came out the same. We missed our families and we were sad to be rid of them. Why shouldn't we live with such hurry and waste of life? We were determined to be starved before we were hungry. We were determined to decrypt our neighbor's Wi-Fi passwords and to never turn on the air conditioning. We vowed to fall in love, headboard clutching, desperate texting hearts in esophagi love. On the subways and at the park and on our fire escapes and in the break rooms, we turned pages, resolved to get to the ends of whatever we were reading. A couple of minutes were the day's most valuable commodity. If only we could make more time, more money, more patience, have better sex, better coffee, boots that didn't leak, umbrellas that didn't involute at the slightest gust of wind. We were determined to make stupid bets. We were determined to be promoted or else to set the building on fire on our way out. <laughs> we were determined to be out of our minds. We couldn't stop following the news. Every 10 seconds, we refreshed our browsers and gawked at the headlines. Dully, we read blogs of friends of friends of friends who had started an organic farm out on the Wachito River. They were out there, pickling and canning and brewing things in the goodness of nature. And soon, we'd worry it was time for us to leave the city and go, go to Uruguay or Mo Morocco or Connecticut, to the, <laughs> to the plains or the mountains or the bay. But we'd bide our time, and after some months or years, our farmer friends would give up the farm and begin studying for the LSATs. We felt lousy about this and wonderful. We missed getting mail. We wondered why we even kept those tiny rings, uh, keys on our crowded rings. Sometimes we would send ourselves things from the office. Sometimes we would handwrite long letters to old loved ones and not send them. We never knew their new address. We never knew anyone's address, just their cross streets and what their doors looked like and which button to buzz and if the buzzers even worked. How many flights to climb and which way to turn off the stairs. Sometimes we missed those who hadn't come to the city with us or who had gone to other different cities. Sometimes we journeyed to see them and sometimes they ventured to see us. And those were the best of times for we were all at home and not at once. And those were the worst of times, for we inevitably longed to all move here or there, yet no one ever came. Somehow, everyone only left. And soon we were practically all alone. Soon we began to hate the forever cramping of our lives, sleeping on top of strangers and sipping coffee with people we knew we knew but couldn't remember where from. Living out of boxes we had no space to unpack. Soon we named the pigeons roosting in our windowsills. We worried they looked mangier than the week before. We heard bellowing in the apartments below us and bed springs creaking in the ones above. Everywhere we saw people with dogs and wondered how they managed it. Did they work from home? Did they not work? Had they gone to the right schools? Did they have connections? We had no connections. Our parents were our guarantors in name only. They called us from their jobs in distant, colorless suburban office parks and told us we could come home anytime, and this terrified us always. But then came those nights creeping up on us 
while we worked busily in dark offices, like submariners lost at sea, sailing through the dark stratosphere in our cement towers. We'd call each other to report. A good thing happened. A compliment had been paid. A favor had been appreciated. An inch of ground had been gained. We wouldn't trade those nights for anything or anywhere. Those nights we remembered why we came to the city. Because if we were really living, then we wanted to hear the cracking in our throats and feel the trembling in our extremities. And if our apartments were coffins and our desks headstones and our dreams infections, if we were all slowly dying, then at least we were going about that great and terrible business together. Thank you. So uh, that's just the prologue, um, and uh, I'm just going to read a short bit from the first chapter uh, to try to introduce some of the characters and a little flavor of what the book is about. Uh, the first chapter of the book is called Living Vicariously, uh, and uh, as you'll soon see, it uh, introduces the five main characters in the, in the book, uh, Irene, George, Sarah, Jacob, and William. Uh, and the five of them are gathering uh, in, uh, in Manhattan, not far from here, actually, uh, at the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, they're going to uh, a fancy party uh, at a rare opportunity to sort of rub elbows with people that, uh, the parts of Manhattan that they don't normally get to see. Um, Irene Richmond ran down the narrow foyer, helping guests get out of their coats, which were dusted with flakes of snow that had been coming down heavily all day and still drifted lightly onto the hotel balcony. Coats that cost more than she earned in a month and that were works of art themselves. Hoods lined with fox fur imported from Finland. A quilted sateen coat filled with goose down and patterned in the latest Japanese style of concentric circles. A long vest made of rabbit, Mongolian lamb's wool. Irene got a thrill from just holding them, but it was always short-lived. By the time the guests had finished warning her not to crease the collars or wrinkle the hems, there was someone else making an even more fashionable entrance. During rare pauses, she checked her phone for messages from George and Sarah. Nothing, and nothing from Jacob either. Twisting in front of the hallway mirror, she receded the bobby pins that kept her blonde hair up off her shoulders. She liked the way her neck looked in the golden light by the door, an elegant extension of her one bared shoulder. She hoped it wasn't too much. Abiba had said only to look nice, but Irene had sensed an implication that she not look nicer than the guests. Juliet then added it was important to look hip, which Irene took to mean young, vital, and strange. Therefore, cerulean leggings, crochet sweater dress, peacock feather necklace, and braided skinny belt. Irene hoped these projected the artistic professional image specified. Every job had its uniform. She checked her eyeshadow, which made her irises look a shade darker, almost black instead of blue. She rubbed at a spot beneath her left eye that had been there for a month now, but had only recently begun to feel sore. Buzz went the door, and she was off to collect a giraffe print bolero from the next artist or heiress to stagger in on midnight black stilettos. The K Gallery's annual holiday party at the Waldorf Astoria was always an impressive affair. All year, Irene and her friends looked forward to this night, the second Friday in December. Not that they didn't go out other nights, not that living in the city wasn't sometimes glamorous, but never anything compared to this. There were 78 people on the exclusive guest list, and renowned chef Mark Herodura was catering. Honest to God movie stars attended. Last year, they'd seen that guy from The Office, and the year before that, Cindy Lauper. <laughs> This was that other New York, always around them, but never visible. For one, this one night, it belonged to them, too. Even with the first big storm of winter going on outside and flights canceled, canceled at JFK and LaGuardia, only Newark soldiered on, they had nearly full attendance. All day, the gallery's owners, Juliet and Abiba, had been commanding Irene from one end of Manhattan to the other. They'd thrust her into snow-capped cars in Chelsea with a wrought iron baboon skeleton, a steal at just $300,000 whose shrieking head had extended dangerously out the window into traffic. <coughs> Wearing a pair of Abiba's oversized duck boots, Irene had sloshed across the posh lobby of the Lexington Avenue Hotel, aching under the weight of a moldy yam encased in bile green propylene, starting at just half a million. Five years ago, when she'd first begun working at the gallery, Irene had gotten thrilled simply from being near such valuable art. But by this point, she was considering telling the driver to take her and the oversized photograph of Trisha Birch's genitals, a million flat, to the George Washington Bridge so she could hurl it into the Hudson. <laughs> or maybe she would just keep going, on and on, out of the city. With the money this one photo was worth, Irene could paint all day and all night for another 20 years, or start her own gallery, 
or institute a progressive artist's colony where young dreamers could take up their work. She could help them avoid the 18-hour days, the perpetual temper tantrums, the name-dropping, the ego trips, the talentless and tormented. Except that, of course, outside New York City, the Trisha Birch photographs were more likely to get her arrested for indecency than for theft. Maybe in LA, she thought. Maybe in London. Maybe on Mars or Neptune. Juliet and Aviva were not horrible bosses, but they had all the fussiness of artists without the brilliance. They had an eye for slick marketing and could start a trend like nobody's business. The higher the K-Gallery climbed in the Chelsea scene, the more Juliet and Aviva drank sickening amounts of Campari and spoke of selling everything and setting sail for the Marquesas like Gauguin. Rule one of living in the city, Irene had learned, as soon as you got there, you had to begin threatening to leave. <laughs> she was theoretically putting money aside for a trip to France from which she privately imagined she'd never return, though it seemed like the same $350 or so kept entering and exiting her savings account. Meanwhile, the trip got more expensive, the exchange rate got worse, and the gallery took up more time. Still it was, as they said, a living, and far from a bad one. Even when she had to examine teacup Yorkie feces to see which should be threaded alongside diamonds on a necklace for the Bryant Park show. Even cataloging 17 years of Percy Bryson's toenail clippings. But she had legit benefits and enough money, money to pay for a cramped studio apartment on East 4th Street where she could paint at night without disturbing a roommate. Plus, she wasn't starving. If not trips for, to France, her paychecks covered a vintage dress or two, movie tickets, bar tabs, and green tea smoothies. Buzz. At last, it was them, George Murphy and Sarah Sherman. George wore a wide smile and a black pinstripe suit. Was it new? It was. Sarah had gotten it for him last week at the Macy's pre-Christmas sale to wear to his postdoc interviews. Irene kissed his cheek and inspected his penny coppery hair. It needed cutting. Irene could never resist the urge to ruffle his head lightly for luck. We made it, George announced. His cornflower blue eyes met the room over Irene's shoulder and then fixed on her. When he spoke to her or to anyone, they never drifted an inch. His three favorite words were, did you know? And after saying them, he had a way of lowering his voice as he told you something terrific about some distant galaxy he was researching out at the North Shore <coughs> Observatory, as if Andromeda B were a restaurant you might want to check out sometime. He seemed to want nothing more than for others to find him handy to have around. Swiftly, he could explain to you the mechanics of an elevator, the science behind a hailstorm, the or the electric spark between your fingers and the fringe of your dress. A good Catholic boy from Columbus, someone had raised him right. George Murphy was attentive in a city of the attention deficient, and for this he was always looked after. No one's ever on time to this thing, Irene said. Here, give me your coat. But George was already hanging it up by himself. Sarah slid in for a kiss from Irene. Some big accident on the LIE, she explained. Irene told her she looked stunning, and Sarah said she must be mental. She'd come straight from the gym and was sure that she must reek, but of course she did not. Her long purple dress was discreetly sequined. Raven-haired and slender-jawed, Sarah forever made Irene itch to break out her charcoals and sketch dark, elegant lines. No matter that she was technically not of the artsy crowd at this party, inside of an hour, half the people there would believe Sarah was the one throwing it. She'd glide from one conversation to the next, sometimes drawing one or two along with her, until no one was a stranger to her or anyone anymore. Did you know were also Sarah's three favorite words, followed not by a fact, but by a person. She always knew someone you knew, a girl in your prom limo, your YMCA summer camp counselor, the barista at the coffee shop you frequent, a man you met at that bar in Chiang Mai, the boy whose hand you held on a third grade field trip to the Museum of Natural History. Some people never forgot a face, Sarah never forgot a connection. George played with his skinny knit tie in the hall mirror. Six car pile up. I've done this commute every day for five years and I've never seen a crack, uh, crash that bad. Sorry, I had to change in a Starbucks bathroom that smelled like dead aardvarks and <coughs> Sarah interrupted. Oh, speaking of, this is for you. She dug an oil stained brown bag from her bottomless purse. Irene peeled back the paper to reveal a single smushed vanilla cupcake. Little rainbow sprinkles formed a lopsided swirl winking up like stars. They made us buy something, can you believe it? In fact, Irene could not believe it. First, Sarah was a rotten liar, and second, everyone knew Starbucks was one place you could use the bathroom without paying for something. <laughs> it might as well be rule two of city living. George winked at Irene as she, she helped slip off Sarah's coat. <coughs> Someone was afraid you didn't eat today, he murmured. Sarah <coughs> pretended to object, but Irene kissed her cheek again. Well, did you, she inquired, and before an answer was given, reached up to poke the faint spot beneath Irene's eye. Irene snapped her head to one side. I had some grapes. 
She already regretted telling Sarah about last week's CT scan, which meant she'd just keep worrying. Eventually, she'd ask about yesterday's follow-up appointment. Jacob here yet? George asked, absently trying to take Sarah's coat so he could hang it. Irene yanked it back. Not yet, but he's always late. But we're late. He's always later. Then, as Irene moved to close the door, she saw someone approaching, a young Korean man who was shyly inspecting the wall. It took two seconds to see he didn't belong there. Distantly, she remembered him from somewhere. He wore a sharp gray Armani suit and held in one hand a bottle of Bollinger Blanc. Who brings champagne to a catered party, Irene wondered, as she tried to remember which gallery he worked for. She wasn't entirely surprised to see Sarah give the boy a bear hug. William Cho, what are you doing here? Irene, did you know William? He was in art history too with McClellan. You sat in on that one. Irene didn't hesitate to grip his wet, gloved hand and welcome. He was very thin with cheekbones that she was sure she'd have remembered if he'd had them in college. People don't just go around getting cheekbones, she told herself. Or coal black eyes like that either. She liked the girlish line of his upper lip. He bit it nervously whenever he looked at her. Normally she wasn't very interested in shyness, but something about him was making her blush. Sarah turned. George, you remember William? They shook hands politely. Sure, William Cho, right? We met at that newspaper party with Lisa Schmidt. Sarah took over as features editor right after Lisa went to Madagascar with that guy who got the roads. Honey, what was his name? Sarah knew it, Henry Fordham Jr., and also that the girl's name had been Lisa Schlick, but from the look on William's face, Irene guessed he didn't know either of them. Hang on, George said. Before we get caught up, let me grab us all something from the bar. It was understood Irene had to wait until the guests had finished arriving, but Sarah said anything involving St. Germain would be fine. It was only then that William thrust forward the bottle of champagne he'd been cradling like a football. George seized it with grateful hands. Damn, this is nice stuff, William. I stole it, William abruptly announced. <laughs> Like, you boosted it, George asked? Don't tell me you boosted this. <coughs> Sarah laughed. Boosted? What are you, a 30s gangster? George winked at her while William clarified. Yeah, I mean, no, I didn't rob a liquor store or anything, but it's been under the coat rack in my boss's office since last Christmas. <laughs> Turning the bottle over, George peeled the shiny gift tag off the bottom. To Lenny from the Berg Geldorf family. Well, thank you, Berg Geldorfs. I'll see <laughs> if I can get the guy to put this on ice. He clapped William on the back, and then while Irene and Sarah turned their attention to William, he slipped into the main room with every appearance of happiness. Truth be told, however, George was feeling unusually nervous. His mind was elsewhere. Ordinarily, the gallery Christmas party was his best excuse all year to get dressed up and feel metropolitan, but this time he was in no mood. He looked around, smiling at everyone and no one in particular, as a sensation crept up his spine that somehow they could tell he was from the Midwest, that these artists could see the sleepy cornfields in his complexion. Not like he'd grown up on a farm. Fairfield Beach was 10 miles from Columbus. His parents had belonged to the yacht club. But tonight, he wasn't feeling very yachty. He was counting on a few drinks to settle his nerves. The accident had been over on the eastbound side, but everyone on his side had been rubbernecking like their lives depended on it. Like they'd never seen a crash before. Ooh, look at the flashing lights. How exciting. He looked up to realize the bartender was eyeing him. Do you have a bucket of ice we could chill this in? The graying-haired man frowned. This isn't a nightclub. I don't do bottle service. The poor guy looked exhausted. George smiled and took a 20 out of his wallet, the only thing in there, and slipped it into the tip jar. This both worked and didn't. The bartender took the bottle and plunked it into an empty punch bowl that he angrily began shoveling ice into, resentful at the implication he could be bought, even if he could be. <laughs> George fidgeted with the button on his new jacket. Open, the fabric whooshed backwards like a cape when he walked too quickly. Closed, it make him look, made him look uptight, almost as bad as that William guy. George couldn't remember having seen him in college, not once. He was quiet, polite, and finally dressed, which meant that Jacob was going to hate him. And just knowing how much Jacob was going to hate him was making George sweat. Where was Jacob, anyway? How was he always, always later than the rest of them? How did he know? Why wouldn't he just show up so he could be mean to William, and the girls could get upset, and George could swoop in to set things right, and they could all go home? When the bartender had finished sourly shoveling the ice, George ordered something off the ornately printed menu called a death in the desert. It tasted sickeningly of licorice. He thought about asking for something else, open bar and all, but didn't want to show weakness. He gulped the drink down and pretended to be deep in appreciation of a nearby painting of a man eating his own bowels. <laughs> if there was one real artist there, it was Irene. Over the years, he'd seen the most outrageous, beautiful things come off her fingertips. She had a sort of effortless, infinite control over the thickness of a line or the shade of oils and the proportion of lightness to shadow. 
Walking through the city's museums, George was often sure that he'd just seen one of her paintings out of the corner of his eye. One another, the bartender grumbled. Death in the desert, George said. That's a pretty hard-boiled name. It's a poem. All the drinks got names of poems. He tapped the company logo on the napkins. Dead Poets Society functions. Cute, George said. So, no living poets? I couldn't get a Billy Collins in a tall glass? <laughs> the wasteland's pretty good, the bartender offered. It's got tea-infused bourbon in it. George was soon handed a cloudy gray drink that tasted like neither tea nor bourbon. In fact, it tasted like nothing at all, which was fine by him, so long as it made the party a little blurrier. Then he got Sarah a fairy queen involving St. Germain and blueberries and resumed scanning the room. Finally, he put his finger on it. Last year, more people had been dressed up, a lot more. In fact, he couldn't see anyone else wearing a suit except for William. Had suits suddenly gone out of style? There were an awful lot of piratical mustaches going on around him. <laughs> Two, no, three different guys with mutton chops. What was the point of looking different in exactly the same way as everybody else? No wonder all their dumb art was so dumb, edgy, but harmless. Pairs of uh, safety scissors in gilded frames. He turned, and his eyes locked with Sarah's. She was chatting with William over by the doors to the balcony. She gave George just the quickest, tiniest smile, and it shattered him like a pane of glass. Could even one of these people paint that? The feeling you get when you're having a crappy night, and the woman you're about to propose to smiles your way. When, with his right hand, George reached across his chest and patted his left jacket pocket. There was the impression of a small jewelry box containing a diamond ring that had belonged to his father's mother's mother, and he would give it to Sarah tonight. Everyone says Gossman's going to be the next Rosenquist, came Irene's soft, sweet voice behind him. She was speaking to a very tall woman and gesturing towards a longish painting of various brightly colored website logos. George liked it, at least it was colorful. I loathe Rosenquist, the tall woman said. <laughs> Irene made a face behind her back as she said, obviously, but that's why. Just then, they both heard a familiar belly laughter. It was Jacob, at last, speaking to an elderly woman in a fox stole. Did you skin that yourself? The workmanship's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> George, Irene sang lightly as she passed him. That's the curator of the, Mor of the Morrison. He didn't know what that was, but it didn't matter. He was the designated extinguisher of Jacob's fires. Still holding Sarah's drink in one hand, George pushed across the room. As he arrived on the scene, Jacob was inspecting the woman's fur. You can hardly see where the hounds got him. <laughs> where have you been, Jake? George asked, looking apologetically at the elderly curator, who took her chance to break for the next room. After taking a sniff of Sarah's drink, Jacob helped himself to a gulp. Ah, Georgie Porgy pudding and pie. Long day up at the asylum. Jake clucked his tongue. I had to wrestle a kid to the ground who thought he was a goddamn ninja. Jacob Blauman worked as an orderly at Anchorage House, a private rehabilitation institute up in Westchester. He kept a short, dark, scholarly beard, which, if he ever shaved, would grow back during a commercial break. Of course, Jacob didn't watch television or own one, and the real reason for the beard George knew was that a boy Jacob madly desired in their sophomore year had offhandedly commented that it made him look, quote, less pudgy. Likewise, Jacob had worn the same brown tweed jacket every day since he'd found it at Goodwill, and Irene had said it made his shoulders look broad. These things went right to his head, it was true. But so what? It was his confidence, more than anything, that George had seen work its magic on all manner of men in bars, train stations, whole food freezer aisles, and library carols. Once, Jacob had written poetry, but now he was just a poet. He specialized in a certain type of epic that was a tough sell in an age of text messages. At least my poems don't fit on a square of toilet paper, he was fond of saying. Now he tended a herd of mental patients who, upon occasion, needed to be held down and syringed and straightjacketed, a job he'd found on Craigslist, believe it or not, which put, which put his size and his psych minor to unexpected use. George, he began, swinging an arm around his old friend, I'd like to go on a fox hunt sometime. What do you say? Oh, at least once before I die, George sighed wistfully. Let's set one up right along Madison Avenue. Get some hound dogs, floppy ears, keen sense of smell. You and I follow on horseback, naturally. One of us plays the bugle. You know, I used to bugle with the Columbus Philharmonic. Jacob lifted a cupped hand to his lips. To do, to do. Most of the people in the room were looking at them now. George ceaselessly enjoyed his former roommate's irreverence, since he couldn't often bring himself to be rude. With Jacob, it was just the opposite. If he ever had impulses towards politeness, Sarah firmly believed he didn't. They were soon drowned out by whatever he was shouting. George liked to think they complimented each other in this way, each living through the other when it suited. Bunch of rubberneckers, Jacob scoffed, no quieter. George grinned. Speaking of, I got stuck behind this six-car pileup today on the... Hang on, where's the bar in this joint? Over there. 
You'll like it. All the drinks are named after poems. Jacob glowed like a thousand watt bulb. Who couldn't love this town? Irene shot them an unappreciative look from across the room and rubbed nonchalantly at her left eye with the back of her right hand as she schmoozed another donor. Shut the fuck up, Jacob bellowed. They have a drink called the Wasteland? Though, it ought to be two words. Waste, space, land. That's the actual title. Nobody gets that right, even if it is highly overrated, he went on. It can't touch the bridge by Hart Crane. Now there's a poem you guys ought to make into a drink. Hints of the East River. He'd have gone on, but got distracted. Hey, why does that Korean kid look so familiar? George ordered two more wastelands, plus five flutes of William's champagne. Now everyone was there, and now things could really get started. I'll right, stop there. Thank you. I'd love to uh, answer any questions. I don't know what, what kind of time we have left, um, but uh, if anybody uh, has anything they'd like to ask or anything, I'd love to talk a little bit more. I wouldn't really love to talk more, but for other people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi. Are you still in the city? I am, uh, for the time being at least. Uh, I'm living in Brooklyn right now with my wife and our lovely three-year-old son Joshua, um, and uh, yeah, and uh, we are, um, yeah, we are, we are there as long as we can hang in there. I think we've been talking about moving in two years for about ten years. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, oh, that's a great question. Um, it was, uh, I don't know, they're both really fun, very different. Um, I, the, uh, I, yeah, gosh, I don't know how to, uh, to answer that. Um, it's such a, it's such a, like, kind of a great thing to be able to go around all over and, and sort of read the book to different people. Um, it was, uh, I'd say, you know, both of them were, were really great in sort of, you know, different ways. Um, this year I got to go to uh, Atlanta, uh, which I, uh, had never been to before, and that was, uh, an awful lot of fun. Um. Yeah, sorry. I can't think of anything better to say than that. <laughs> it's really nice to be able to do this. Last time I did, we did the launch here at uh, the Center for Fiction, and then I left on the tour. Uh, I'm really loving uh, being able to kind of come home here, uh, which also feels like a homecoming, too. I lived in Manhattan for uh, 10 years, 9 years, something like that, uh, before we moved to Brooklyn. And so it's really nice to be able to kind of come back here again, and uh, not just here to the center, but here in Manhattan. Uh, most of the characters in the book live in Manhattan. Most of the book is sort of set in Manhattan. Um, and uh, so, yeah, um, a lot of it was written while I still lived here. So. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Where did you write this book? Where? Uh, all over. Um, <laughs> my house uh, has uh, lately become more of a playground uh, than a house, so, uh, or than a writing space. So um, there are too many trains and things like that everywhere right now for a lot of writing to get done. Um, I have a long commute. I, uh, I, I go up to uh, SUNY New Paltz College is where I teach right now. And, uh, and on my way up there on the, on the bus, I have about two and a half hours each way to, to write. And that's been, uh, that's been wonderful. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I've never you know, really had the luxury or the, I don't know what, what, it, what to call it exactly, of like lots of uh, uninterrupted writing time, uh, which would of course be lovely, although even over the summer vacations when I do have more of that, uh, I tend not to get that much done. Uh, I think I do best when I have like 10 minutes between class and I have to run back to my office and type out a paragraph and then run back out and teach another class. So um, something about that kind of pressure, uh, you know, makes it, uh, I have to do it then or I won't get a chance for two more days, some that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. You tend to switch perspective. Um, I haven't read this one yet, but just from the example there and then from Unchangeable Spots. Uh, when you are creating the story organizationally, do you anticipate that certain stories will be told from one perspective or another, or does it become a retelling or kind of a lack of organic book in there? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, yeah, this, uh, this, this book, uh, aside from the, that opening part and a couple other sections like it, um, which are told in the first person plural, 
Um, this book's all in the third person, uh, unlike my first book, which was written in the first person, um, had a first person narrator um, who keeps sort of shifting his identity, but, um, but he's always the, the narrator. Um, in this book, uh, the third person point of view uh, it sort of uh, floats around um, between the different characters. You get a little taste of that just in the part that I read. It, we open uh, close to Irene and then we sort of like slide off into George as he goes in, across the room. And um, throughout the rest of that chapter, that kind of keeps happening. Um, it was something actually, I, I'll be perfectly honest, I, I ripped off of uh, a, friend, a, a former teacher of mine. Uh, confessed to me that uh, she had, uh, she's an Irish writer, uh, and she confessed to me she'd never read James Joyce, uh, and then uh, one day she read The Dead and was like, wow, this is a great story, and of course, it's an amazing story, um, and she said that she then sat down and tried to do her own version of The Dead, uh, and I thought, well, that sounds great, so I, I sort of did the same thing, uh, when that was one of the ways that this chapter got started, uh, had this idea about everybody kind of coming to a party, uh, and Joyce does this sort of really beautiful, you know, th thing where the point of view just follows people around through the party, and you open with the girl who's checking, you know, the door, and then uh, and then move off with the guests and throughout the party. And uh, I just love that idea. So uh, so yeah, that happens in the first chapter, and then throughout the rest of it, um, different sections are sort of more dedicated than to specific characters. Each chapter, um, each character gets a couple of sections to sort of tell their part of the story. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was a lot of fun. It was a big challenge to kind of try to inhabit all five of these people's perspectives and write them in a way that hopefully feels really different uh, as you get from one person to, a, to the next. But, uh, but it was a lot of fun to be able to you know, spend some time in each of their heads. Yeah. yeah. Of the various locations that you have throughout the book, which is the most meaningful to you? Uh, that's a great question. Um, there's uh, almost the whole book is set in New York City. Uh, in different places, they do go around, uh, out, you know, within Manhattan, and then also I think they make, I think they venture out to almost all the boroughs at different points in, in the book. Um, but uh, I think the maybe the best part actually is the the, the one part um, that uh, takes place really farther outside of the city. Uh, there's a chapter where all the characters go uh, to Long Island um, to the North Fork to go sort of on a, a getaway weekend and drink a bunch of wine and uh, we. Uh, uh, read that beautiful thing earlier today. Um, so a lot of that sort of idea came from uh, this trip to Sonoma that we took from a long time ago. Um, but the, uh, uh, then uh, we decided that it was actually impractical for the characters to uh, all fly to California in the middle of the book. So we, uh, so we went to Long Island. Uh, and uh, yeah, and that, uh, that's a great moment in the book for me uh, because you get to see all the characters together. Uh, and they uh, and they get sort of outside of the city, and I, I hope that you can kind of sense a little bit of their discomfort, even and uh, suddenly being sort of in a new, unfamiliar territory, um, which is yeah, which is kind of fun. Yeah. yeah hi. Hi. Uh, first off, I thought the book was great. Thanks. And, um, I just want to say for the second book that you published, this book's got a lot more publicity than, than your first book, and a lot more reviews. Which Gone straight to my head. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the last time I'll see most of my friends. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, uh, that's really nice of you to say. I, uh, I'm, I'm glad it. I'm glad it seems that way uh, for one thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think it changes. I, I I don't think it should really affect things all that much. I don't know long term, but uh, obviously I have high hopes for this book. I hope you know, a million plus people read it and love it. Um, that's always everybody's hope. That may be totally unrealistic, I don't know. But, um, but uh, you know, it's a special book for me and I think it's something that, uh, that a lot of people will love. Um, so in that sense, I'm really glad and grateful for a lot of you know, people to hopefully be starting to hear about it. Um, on the other hand, uh, yeah, I think there's, uh, there, I don't know, there's something about, you know, uh, these couple of weeks right around when a book comes out that uh, are really exciting, and then, you know, one of the I, sort of great things I think about being a writer is that once it's over, you're pretty much right back where you started, you know, you've got a desk and a blank piece of paper, and uh, you got to start writing something else, so, uh, yeah, I'm actually kind of a little bit looking forward to that part, I think, I don't know if that, if that answers your question. Um, yeah. any, any other great, these are great questions. So.
One more? Um, I thought that last question was interesting because recently I've been reading in the Times about what happened to Harper Lee when mm. her first book was, you know, so unexpectedly and got so much attention, it, it kind of ruined her life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it made you sound pretty level headed about it all. Try so. it. <laughs> Uh, this isn't To Kill a Mockingbird yet, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. um, the, I, it's, it's funny actually, I used to teach a class uh, not, uh, not, not that long ago uh, on, uh, on, on reclusive writers, uh, and uh, I loved, it was mostly just an excuse to teach um, Nine Stories by J.D. Salinger, which is one of my favorite books. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure my boss, who is, or my former boss who's here, I just went into his office and said I want to I want to teach this book somewhere. Can you know help me think of an idea? Uh, so I came up with a class about recluses. Um, but it was actually a, fant a really fantastic class, and we read uh, a little bit of um, To Kill a Mockingbird, and we watched some of uh, Capote uh, as well, because I would, thought that was really interesting in Capote how she becomes like a, a, a minor character, sort of in the background of his story, and you see how fame sort of r ruins his life in in a lot of ways too. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a fa I think it's really fascinating. It's actually something I've been thinking a lot about writing about at some point. Uh, I love that idea of uh, I've, you know uh, I've written about this uh, before in different essays, but Salinger uh, for me is one of the writers that sort of made me want to be a writer when I was in high school, uh, and uh, and it was it was weird to have my uh, vision of what a writer should look like be basically a ghost. I mean, he was uh, he was alive. Uh, up, up until just a few years ago, but totally, you know, never heard from, no one really knew what was going on, and, uh, you know, it was maddening, sort of, as I was growing up, to think, you know, I love his work, and I have so many questions, and he's there, you know, he's sitting, like, up in Connecticut somewhere, or New, New Hampshire, um, but, uh, but you can't ask him anything, and uh, so I've always been sort of fascinated by what drives somebody to do that. There's something noble, I think, you know, on some level about it, you know, the idea that the work should be able to speak for itself, and that the answers to the questions should be within it. Um, the writer shouldn't necessarily have to, you know, be there to, to push it out there, I guess. But, um, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I hope that's not in my future. <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, there aren't any other questions. I'm, I'd be really uh, honored and uh, would love to uh, sign copies for anybody who wants to get them. I'm sure they're, they're for sale in the back, maybe. Um, and uh, please stick around. Thank you.